All right. All right, thank you everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to this product theater here at DDW in Chicago for Tissue Cipher, Barrett's Esophagus. Uh, really excited to have you all join today with this uh, panel that we've got assembled to discuss tissue cipher test in non-dysplastic Barrett's Esophagus. My name is Matthew Goldberg. I'm a dermatologist and dermatopathologist by training, and I'm the medical director at Castle Biosciences. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure to be here to uh, really discuss how to integrate the new technology of Barrett's of, of tissue cipher in the management of non-dysplastic Barrett's Esophagus. I'm here today with this panel. I'm joined here today by uh, three gastroenterologists, Dr. John Lippa uh, from the U.S. 30. So John. Harshit Kara from Geisinger and Raman Litasami, um, who are here today to really discuss how the tissue cipher test can be integrated into the practice uh, and management of patients with Barrett's esophagus with a focus on non dysplastic Barrett's esophagus. So I'll provide a brief introduction here about the tissue cipher test itself, a bit of a background here to set the playing field a little bit, and then we'll really focus on case discussions from uh, Dr. Lippum, Dr. Kara as well as a discussion and an update of the EGA clinical practice update with Dr. Murtasame. And then we'll conclude with some closing remarks about risk-wide management decisions more broadly. So I want to st start here just by uh, asking a quick question for the group. Uh, what are the main challenges that you have in managing patients with Barrett's esophagus? I know that's a very amorphous question, but just high level, some of the major challenges that you face when encountering a patient with Barrett's esophagus for your respective bites. Surgery to gastroenterology. Who's going first? Go for it. Well, I mean, I think to me the biggest challenge is the fact that we're treating every patient the same. So we've got a patient with non-dysplastic Barrett's and it's a one size fits all type of treatment. So every patient with non-dysplastic Barrett's gets treated the same way. We know some of them are gonna progress to cancer, but yet we're still recommending the same as the patient that clearly doesn't progress. So to me, that's the biggest challenge is starting to personalize our approach uh, to these patients. Yeah, I would, I would agree with what John said. In addition to that, I would say there's two other things I think are a challenge. One is uh, we don't really have good screening tests. And I think there's a lot of patients with Barrett's out there that we don't know about and we can't put into surveillance. And I think finding ways that we can do that better, perhaps non-endoscopic either would be one. And I think going back to the risk stratification, uh, even in the patients we're doing surveillance on, we're not very good at detecting dysplasia on endoscopic examination. And of course, then we're waiting for the detection of dysplasia rather than perhaps being able to predict it at an earlier stage, which is where um, tissue-based stratification, I think, could help us. No, I agree to those points. I think, you know, the fear always is the, the fear of risk disease. You know, no matter how much diligently we review the Barrett's and sample the Barrett's, the question is always, you know, why do we get interval cancers? Why do we get interval progression? And guidelines are generalized to the masses, but then what about my patient? And I think my fear always is, what about, what about missed disease, prevalent disease right now, and what about progressors who may progress in the interval? Thank you for that, for that background. And, and Tissue Cipher as a tool for risk stratification was developed not to solve all of the questions that face the field of treating patients with Barrett's esophagus, but really focusing on improving the accuracy of risk stratification for those patients who have already been diagnosed with Barrett's esophagus. I, I think, Dr. Nusama, your point is well taken that there's people out there who are not yet in the surveillance paradigm, then there's a lot of movement in other spaces to get people routed uh, to endoscopy for diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus. But what do we do once they're diagnosed? And really, this is the question that Tissue Cipher was developed to help to answer is, how do we improve our risk stratification? And the Tissue Cipher approach to do this is looking at biomarkers and spatial biology, we call spatial omics, really looking at relevant biomarkers that are located within the tissue that we take for our diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus from the pitch biopsies, looking at biomarkers within the tissue using immunofluorescence, and then see if you can identify patterns that actually help to differentiate between progressors and non-progressors. This becomes possible because you can actually create high dimensional images using digital pathology tools that are now available and becoming more wide or so. What that means is that you can look at immunoplex immunofluorescence images layered on one another, and you can contextualize the presence or absence of biomarkers in relation to one another, really accessing the promise of spatial biology 
within the Barrett's esophagus samples that we take. And you can use AI-based tools to actually develop a, a long algorithm, a test that can reliably, objectively differentiate between progressors and non-progressors, uh, which make up the tissue cipher test. It's essentially an AI-based algorithm based on the evaluation of these nine relevant biomarkers on the tissue that's taken from the Barrett's esophagus diagnostic samples. And then this has gone through multiple rounds of clinical validation, clinical validation in large sets of progressors and non-progressors, patients with Barrett's esophagus who progressed to high-grade dysplasia or esophageal adenocarcinoma, and those that didn't, to determine whether or not the test can reliably and objectively and reproducibly differentiate between progressors and non-progressors within the Barrett uh, esophagus cohort. A little bit more about like, these relevant biomarkers. These are selected based on their relevance for uh, disease progression in esophageal endocarcinoma and high-grade dysplasia. So they include things that span relevant biologic domains, such as tumor suppressors, uh, as well as other immune and inflammatory markers and things related to angiogenesis as well. So these are biologically relevant markers that are located within the tissues that we sample already. And it's not just looking at the relative presence or absence of one of these biomarkers, but really the relationship of one to each other and then the added value is that you can identify where they're located within the tissue. So you can look at the presence or absence of these biomarkers within the diagnostic tissue of Barrett's esophagus to be able to define where they're located to relevant biologic structures and objects to actually make the tissue cipher test. Importantly, the test result is not returned as a jumble of numbers or uh, relative intensities of immunohistochemical markers, but rather a validated risk score, either a low risk score on the left a high risk score on the right or intermediate in the middle, which provides a five-year probability of progression, an individualized risk score of progression of high-grade dysplasia or esophageal adenocarcinoma about over five years that's independent of the histologic grading of low-grade, indefinite four, or non-dysplastic Barrett's that's provided as part of routine care. So with that intro, I want to pass it to uh, Dr. Lippem here to go through uh, the first class. All right. Well, hopefully, hopefully this clicker works. Now, I am a surgeon, so be easy on me. Um, I am a very sensitive person. Um, this is supposed to be interactive, so hopefully you logged on to the poll everywhere. But it, this case is meant to stimulate your thinking and kind of go over what you think you should do with this patient. This is a real patient. It's one of my patients. If I can get the clicker to go. So it's a 77-year-old gentleman, white gentleman, really no significant family history. Um, BMI of 26, had reflux for 25 plus years, been on Nexium for 20 years and some various other medications. Um, his reflux is pretty well controlled, no smoking history to speak of. So nothing in at least the past medical history that really screams that this patient is at risk for anything. Um, he has had a history of non-dysplastic Barrett's since 2015. So he's sort of been living with his Barrett's. It comes back periodically for surveillance endoscopies. He did get a, a laparoscopic hiatal hernia repair and a lynx to help control his reflux. And he represented earlier this year just for his surveillance of his Barrett's. So on the endoscopy, um, he had about a one centimeter segment of columnar lining, um, so a very short segment. Uh, the links appeared to be good. It was at the GE junction. The valve looked pretty good at the hill grade two. Uh, no recurrence of his hiatal hernia. Obviously, we biopsied his Barrett's and it came back as every other endoscopy has, showing non dysplastic Barrett's. So, Traditional management here, I think all in the audience would hopefully agree that this patient is very low risk. Um, treatment recommenda recommendations would be maybe have him come back in five years, three years, maybe never because of his age. And so here's one of these poll everywhere questions. So if you've logged on to the system, please tell me what you would do for this patient. Again, one centimeter segment, non-dysplastic Barrett's, 77-year-old gentleman, really no significant risk factors. So I'll let it percolate here a little bit. 
So most would have them come back somewhere between three and five years, one to five years, we'll call it. I'd be curious if we could uh, ask this in the poll, the, the people that want them to come back in a year. Uh, doesn't look like anybody else is gonna consider ablation therapy in this gentleman for a one centimeter segment. No takers, nobody? Nope. No, I got some head shaking, no chance, that's overkill. Nope. The hammer and the fly, fly analogy. All right, so most would agree that we probably shouldn't survey him, have him come back in whatever, three years we'll call it. Crap. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So anyway, we sent his pathology for tissue cyber analysis. Um, and based on that, his risk stratification came back at high risk. His risk of progressing in a five-year period was 35.6%. So the risk of development of cancer is nearly 36% in this gentleman. So I'll pose the question again, based on this, would it change your management? Are you still going to have this patient come back in three to five years? At not having come back at all. What was that? Ablate him now. And that's what I think the majority of uh, the audience is doing. No change in management for 20%. Yeah, shorter surveillance. But it looks like about 60% of you would send this gentleman for ablation. is painful this clicker so uh, yeah, 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 yeah. okay I'm not as retarded as I appear so the tissue cyber results really have helped us guide management uh, at USC now every patient is getting it and it really has changed our management my fellow will be presenting some data from our institution tomorrow which shows that it it's changed our management in about 50% of the cages, cases. In this particular one, it upstaged it. We did send him for endoscopic uh, eradication therapy. It took two sessions to get rid of his Barrett's. Um, but in other cases, it allowed us to extend that surveillance period from let's say three years to five years, or in some cases to eliminate it all altogether um, in patients that are a little bit older. I think it's you now, Raman. Good luck on the clicker. <laughs> no, and I think before I before I talk, I mean, uh, I, I think the the point here is is when you think about risk stratification before John presented that data, what did we have? Right, we had a patient who had no dysplasia, right, which is probably the primary predictor of kind of how we proceed. Uh, you go by length. Uh, but the length was one centimeter, I think John mentioned, which traditionally carries a 0.1% per centimeter per year risk. Um, so the five-year risk would have been 0.5%. And then John showed you data suggesting that the five-year risk was actually, I think, 35%. So the use of that test essentially increased the risk by 70-fold compared to 0.5 to 35%. So, I mean, and those are, and as I said, it, it seemed to, you know, change your action and, and it was an actionable change in management. So, and that's what we're trying to do is, is sort of more intelligently uh, manage these patients, this huge group of non-dysplastic patients we have that we generally tend to bundle under the same umbrella and try to come up with a more um, precision approach. So, um, I just briefly will talk about the uh, AGA clinical practice update, which uh, John was a part of. Uh, and uh, this really combined uh, uh, sort of the expertise of uh, um, many Barrett's experts there, and, uh, and this essentially had uh, several uh, recommendations regarding new technologies and innovation specifically related to surveillance and screening in Barrett's esophagus, which, which is what most of us are doing. Um, and so one of the statements says that tissue systems pathology-based prediction uh, may be utilized for risk stratification of patients with non blasted Barrett's, as, as John nicely showed in his example. Um, and part of that evidence that we used in making this recommendation was that high-risk scores for non blasted Barrett's patients were associated with a rate of progression 
of around 6 and 6.9%, which is actually comparable to low grade. And I think most sort of recommendations and guidelines uh, offer uh, at least a suggestion, if not a stronger recommendation, to treat low grade dysplasia, particularly when confirmed uh, by two pathologists at this point. So, um, and so I'll, and I'll show in the next slide here that uh, the pathway that we sort of developed um, incorporates sort of this risk stratification to survive, pro provide a more nuanced care for patients uh, with, with Barrett's esophagus. And one of the things that I would say is currently we make decisions on whether it's low grade we do this or high grade we do this, but essentially what we're really saying is low grade carries a certain risk, length carries a certain risk. And I think what I would like to see ultimately is is that we make decisions based on progression probabilities and percentages rather than sort of labels. And, and I think that, and that's where you can use numbers like John just presented to help guide your therapy. So uh, with one additional slide, let's see, this goes, there we go. Uh, so this is the uh, pathway that uh, was proposed. And so on the top, which I'll just go over briefly, um, we talk about screening for patients, and, and one of the things that we mentioned, John's patient had a long history of GERD, um, and while certainly that can be present, uh, we know that a large number of patients uh, may not have that risk factor, but his patient was also male, Caucasian, and over age 50, and meets among many other criteria that are present. But, but we've now sort of put GERD as not a prerequisite, but one of many characteristics in terms of screening. You can do a family history, uh, and then you can sort of create a variety of uh, sort of uh, potential screening options as well as GERD management. Um, and then what we do recommend in patients who do get an upper endoscopy is um, consider uh, certainly standard Seattle protocol biopsies, um, uh, perhaps using adjunct technology such as the Watts brush, and then also potentially using tissue cipher, which again can be done even on pathology specimens that you've previously obtained. So. You don't have to do it necessarily at the time. Uh, and then based on those results, perhaps, refer to an expert center for treatment. Now, the majority of patients that you see are in the middle box there, which is known Barrett's coming to you for surveillance. Um, and again, you certainly want to do your usual risk management for, for controlling their GERD, um, you know, and doing a proper clinical evaluation. And again, uh, we do recommend detect using potentially, um, you know, uh, the uh, potential for using a watch sampling to perhaps improve your detection of dysplasia as well as um, tissue cipher for risk stratification. And then of course the bottom was people with known neoplasia and those people are managed for uh, you know, endoscopic eradication therapy if appropriate or referral to someone like John for uh, esophagectomy and surgical management. I think that's, there we go. Uh, good luck one in there. Yeah. <laughs> you want to try? <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's give it a shot. See how long my hands go. Uh, so again, thank you for those points. I think I present a different perspective on a similar case. And as we talked about, is finding that needle in the haystack. You know, we have this haystack full of non-dysplastic patients. We clearly know some of those are going to progress and some don't. And But we apply the same universal guidelines to everyone based on segment length, clinical features, but how can we find that patient? So to give a slightly different patient presentation, you know, I have a younger patient, so this is my patient with 35-year-old female, Caucasian female, with, uh, uh, no, uh, with past medical history, though, so there's no family history. There is obesity class two. She's had chronic GERD for over 10 years and continues to use uh, PPI therapy uh, and is a non-smoker. So additional consideration, she uh, presents for a follow-up of her reflux and follow-up of her Barrett's esophagus. She's had missing from the application for her symptomatic reflux in the past. So we would think that that would be helping her with the reflux, but clearly she continues to be symptomatic despite her fund application. So on the endoscopy, she has a long segment Barrett. So she has a C7M8, so an eight centimeter long Barrett uh, at an outside hospital biopsy. And the reason for the referral was the outside physician saw some nodularity and referred for EMR appropriately so. So the workup of our Barrett's cases, if there is any nodularity, we would consider resection for a definitive diagnosis. The nodularity turned out to be just from esophagitis, so she was put on a, a, a high-dose PPI therapy, 
So when she came to me, she had this flat Barrett's uh, and had this pathology of non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus. So this is a repeat endoscopy with me, uh, showed a C6M8, long segment Barrett's, extensive high definition white light, narrow band imaging, every one centimeter Seattle protocol biopsies, four quadrants, and no evidence of nodularity. And she continued to have this Nissen from the application and all nine jars, so GE junction and the entire eight centimeters of Barrett's four quadrant, everything comes back as non-dysplastic. As per, as we discussed, the role of other adjunctive diagnostic modalities is what about mist disease? Because obviously Seattle protocol, we're missing 90% of the surface area. So to cover the areas in between, we added the warts and with the warts sampling came back as indefinite for dysplasia. So now we're in a little bit of a pickle because my detailed Seattle protocol biopsy is non-dysplastic. What shows maybe there is something else, there is something hiding, but does not give a clear diagnosis of dysplasia. So it doesn't say that it's low grade or high grade. So we have now non-dysplastic and indefinite, and uh, she's as per long segment, but non-dysplastic, traditionally speaking, would be a low risk patient. And the treatment recommendation, if we follow up with the what still, would be a three to six month repeat endoscopy. Now she's had, she's a young patient, has had multiple endoscopies, just had an endoscopy at an outside hospital for nodularity, and now we've repeated the endoscopy, and now we have to tell her she has, she's indefinite for dysplasia. So based on this, at this current information, what would you recommend? Would we repeat the endoscopy again sooner and resample her again with Seattle protocol and what's? Would we bring her back in one to three years? Would we survey her in three to five years? or again put her on a PPI, no high dose PPI therapy and no further endoscopy or offer ablation based on this current information that we have. So we have a long segment non-dysplastic Barrett's on histopathology and indefinite for dysplasia with the box. So about two thirds of people right, would rightfully survey her at this point, if we go by guidelines, we do not have enough evidence to offer her ablation. We've not found definitive dysplasia, indefinite for dysplasia, long segment, but she doesn't have a family history or any other high-risk features. So, you know, rightfully so, we would have ideally called her back in one to three years. But again, is she my needle in the haystack? How do I pick her out? So we sent for a tissue cycle score on this uh, biopsy that we already obtained. And this is the beauty of the test is I don't have to go back to uh, get more sample. I already had the histopath that is already in the search path. I can order this post-operatively as, as a post-hoc analysis of, oh, at this point, I do need more information. So the sample that's already there, we sent it off for tissue cipher and came back as high risk. Now the risk course drastically changes to a five-year risk of progression to 14% with a risk score of 6.7. So now given this new information, how would that change our management? What would, you, would you do anything differently in regards to surveillance or management of this patient now? So everybody's on board. See, we're preaching, we're preaching to the choir again. So uh, I agree, you know, upstage, definitely, at this point, we have enough evidence that her risk of progression is gonna be significantly higher. And this changes our management, changes our outlook. It gives us some objective data to act on. It's no longer about let's keep sampling. I hope I didn't miss anything. Let's keep repeat PPI therapy, repeating the watts. We've done all that. We did the watts for missing the interval area. We did the Seattle protocol, and now with the tissue cipher as an adjunctive information, we knew that this is by needle in the haystack. She is the patient I was able to find who's gonna progress. And she either has incident prevalent disease right now that I may have missed despite the sampling, or she could be a high-risk progressor who's gonna progress, and, and she's not the one that we wanna sit down. So again, this is a patient discussion. As you discuss with the patient, this is what we got. We can either upstage you by increasing this, uh, you know, reducing the surveillance interval, bring you sooner, or offer ablation. Because ablation, again, we have to go through the risk and benefits of that. So that was discussed with her, and she clearly chose ablation immediately. So we offered her radiofrequency ablation, given the long segment, we did a circumferential radiofrequency ablation 
and based on the tissue cipher guided management she was upstaged uh, and the clinical decision would have been to increase surveillance versus EET and patient opted for EET. Three sessions later with radiofrequency ablation, she achieved complete eradication of intestinal metaplasia. So we were able to treat complete Barrett's within three sessions, usually which I do about eight weeks apart. So within a span of six months, we were able to obtain CEIM. <clears throat> back, at, back at you, John. My, my joy of the clicker. All right, one more case for you to kind of illustrate how this can uh, help you or guide management. So the next patient's a 38-year-old gentleman uh, in white male, no significant family history, a little bit on the overweight side, BMI of 33, had reflux for most of his life since his teenage years, so about a 20-year history. Um, been on medications with pretty good results for about 20 years. Uh, he's a non-smoker, non-drinker. Um, he's had the diagnosis of non-dysplastic Barrett's since about 2007. So kind of a long history of non-dysplastic Barrett's. We did take him to the operating room and he got a hissin fund application or a partial fund application in 2014. We uh, brought him in for his surveillance endoscopy, and what we found was the known Barrett's. So it's about a four centimeter segment, so technically a long segment of Barrett's. Um, his Nissen appeared intact. He had a nice hill grade one valve. There was a small one centimeter parasophageal hernia and a, and a LA grade A esophagitis. Um, we biopsied it uh, against the uh, I think three or four different jars, and uh, I don't think we used the watts on this, but anyway, it came back as non-dysplastic Barrett's as it always has. So traditional management here, I throw it out to all of you. You know, patient clearly seems to be fairly low risk. Um, we recommended or would have recommended coming back in about three years for another endoscopy. And so I throw it out, like I said to you guys, what would you do with this patient? Fairly low risk, four centimeter segment, non-dysplastic Barrett's. Have him come back in three to five years, shorter interval, one to three years. Maybe repeat the endoscopy, do a Watts this time. What are your thoughts? Place on high dose PPI, no further endoscopies, or anybody who would ablate this gentleman? No takers for ablation? It's sitting there. Well, it looks like most of you would, would uh, have them come back in somewhere between three and five years, one to five years in majority. So we sent his uh, biopsies also for tissue cipher, and his risk stratification came back as low. His five-year probability of progression was only 3%, um, which is tiny. So this gave us confidence to discuss with him that he is very low risk of progression. We definitely don't need to do this at a one-year period, but I'm interested to see what you guys think. Has this changed your recommendations at all? Let me get back to it. I swear it has a mind of its own. Um, so is it going to change your management at all? Downstage, longer surveillance? An other category. I'm not sure what other would be, but I swear I didn't touch the button. Oh, sure. Now you give me one. Yep. All right. We'll keep it there for just a couple seconds. Um, so it looks like at least half of you it would change your management to increasing that surveillance period. The 50% that are other, be curious, we have microphones later to see what exactly that would be. Anybody right, right, got one in the back there? I think your patient needs better heart and hernia repair. Your body esophagitis is still ongoing and that's a problem. Later on in life, this Barrett's is going to progress because you're having Los Angeles classification B esophagitis in a patient who has had photoplication performed. I think the reflux needs to be addressed. 
Yeah, and I don't disagree uh, that his reflux probably needs to be better controlled if he's got some esophagitis down there. He does have a recurrent parasophageal hernia. So I think that point well taken and uh, that I would agree, especially as a surgeon. Um, well, moving swiftly on, if there are any other comments, um, obviously based on his tissue cipher, um, we talked to him about surveillance protocol. A lot of these patients, as I'm sure, are very, very sure you're aware of, are very worried about this diagnosis of Barrett's. And some of them, you know, want to come back yearly or tomorrow to have a yet another endoscopy. This has given us a little bit of confidence and them some confidence that, no, coming back in three to five years is, is okay based on the results of this test. So it has helped us kind of calm down this type of patient that normally would probably demand having another endoscopy in about a year. One of the, one of the things just to emphasize before moving on to this is that, you know, the tissue cipher test is ordered in these three cases at slightly different moments after different amounts of clinical work has been done. You know, your first case after, after endoscopy, after Dr. Carr, your case after uh, multiple biopsies, EMR, and Seattle protocol for, for a long segment. And then this gentleman after uh, many years of surveillance. So it can occur after multiple different time points in someone's arc of care. And I'm interested just in if you think that this essentially can be combined as an independent data point with the information that we know already. And it can be applied at different time points in some ways disease course with non dysplastic parasophagus. If that tracks in some ways will how you how you think about this in this test. Independent of what you know and can be combined at multiple different time points in the disease progression. Yeah, I mean uh -huh. I, I think that the short answer I would say is yes, um, you know, and, and obviously right now, uh, like I mentioned, we have dysplasia, we have length. Uh, there are some clinical risk score, uh, scores that are available, uh, but a lot of those incorporate dysplasia and length. So they're also a sort of uh, double counting. So, you know, so if you want to try to come up with something independent, uh, particularly based on biomarkers or the anatomy, uh, I think this is a, sort of a unique test that doesn't that overlap the others. Uh, and as you said, you can use it to upstage disease and, and perhaps act more aggressively, but also uh, perhaps reassure patients who are anxious or prolong surveillance intervals. So uh, it's not just one way. It, it can be used, you know, in both directions. And the other part also is this is personalized risk score. So we're not saying population-based risk score. Many of the guidelines are based on data studies that are population, but what does it mean to the patient? You know, and this is more about the patient's risk of progression based on tissue already collected, so they don't have to undergo yet another sample collection. And the other part is I don't have to think about it before the fact. I can put get all the data points after the procedure, the surge path, the WAPS report, the patient's clinical parameters. If it's an outside referral, then I can go back to their outside path and figure out on that I may not order it on this path, but maybe the one that was collected previously, if I had showed a higher rate of dysplasia. So it gives me the flexibility to order it at any point in their clinical management with an already existing tissue and personalize it to that patient, saying this is your risk score of progression, and that's why the management decision is more personal. It's, it's about how we're going to manage that particular patient. And it is possible that, you know, in someone who is not fully reassured by a diagnosis of found dysplastic parrots, but as a pathology perspective, when we're looking for the presence or absence of dysplasia on a slide, in some ways, when you don't see dysplasia, how confident are you that it's out there? Or how confident are you that the precursors to what might become dysplasia aren't actually just hiding behind on the next section? We're very like that. And, and that's always the worry about the missed areas, right? No matter what, however good job we do, it's just the nature of it. It's not that we're doing a bad job. It's just the nature of the disease is these patients are going to have skipped areas that we're not sampling. And with this test, it picks up the fever defect and tells us not just in that biopsy, but is that disease hiding or is this disease that's going to grow? And so I'll conclude here just with a, a bit of a, a paradigm that we put forward here with tissue cipher thinking about some of the clinical decisions that we discussed today through these cases um, and looking at the landscape of options that are available to patients who've been diagnosed with Barrett's esophagus. So based on guidelines, we look at uh, individuals who've been diagnosed with Barrett's esophagus, we look at the presence or absence of dysplasia. You have non-dysplastic Barrett's, definite for dysplasia, or low-grade dysplasia, and the presence or absence, obviously in the context of the other clinical factors, 
route us to management strategies of surveillance and intervention seen here. So for non-dysplastic bearers, three to five years, as we discussed a lot today, and low-grade dysplasia, we think about higher or more frequent levels of surveillance endoscopies with the possibility for EED for those individuals with low-grade dysplasia. But with the potential for risk stratification and the improvement of risk stratification with tissue cipher, we can begin to articulate that different risk groups within these essentially monolithic categories of non-dysplastic ferrets or low-grade dysplasia. And for patients with non-dysplastic ferrets esophagus, it might become easier, as in this case of low-grade dysplasia, to more closely adhere to the three to five years of follow-up recommended by guidelines for a patient with not only no evidence of dysplasia histologically, but also an independent risk score uh, from tissue cipher as a low risk of progression to both high-grade dysplasia and esophageal adenocarcinoma. On the high-risk or intermediate risk score, someone who has an increased risk of progression. You could take a patient with non-dysplastic Barrett's, who we would group uniformly as all having a very low risk of progression or provide a first whole risk that actually articulates them as having a greater that would be expected risk of progression to high-grade dysplasia or esophageal cancer and route them for more close levels of surveillance or frequent surveillance or intervention therapy akin to what we might think of conceptually for our low grade dysplasia patients, because they might have, to your point, Dr. Bethesemble, the same amount of risk. And what we think about here is that we know a great deal once we get back our biopsies from our GI pathology colleagues, right? And our pathology colleagues, we know the presence or absence of dysplasia that tracks to our population level statistics for risk of progression. Then our non-dysplastic parents patients have overall less risk than patients in whom dysplasia has been identified. And we then map that onto clinically actionable risk thresholds, kind of either by guidelines or for our own practice patterns that one can develop, thinking about routing patients with low risk of progression to for less frequent surveillance, and patients with a higher risk of progression to more frequent surveillance or interventions with things like WILU-TU. So the promise of tissue cipher here is that you can identify and subdivide the risk of these individuals by layering an independent risk stratification for progression of high-grade dysplasia short esophageal adenocarcinoma. And here at the bottom left, you can identify non-dysplastic ferrous esophagus patients, patients whom dysplasia is not seen, as having a very low risk of progression when you layer the tissue cipher low risk score of this individual at the bottom left. And in the same way, you can unmask risk of progression that is present in patients with non-dysplastic ferrous esophagus who cross clin clinically actionable thresholds to move beyond long-term surveillance over long, many years between them to either higher intensity surveillance or intervention with NPT based on the, the, the amount of risk that could be identified and is in the patient. And I think this tracks with some of the framework we presented at the, in the patients, hopefully resonance with those uh, of you that treat these, therefore, treat these patients with yeah. esophagus of practice. I see a question here. One of the problems in patients with lung barrier esophagus is doing multiple biopsies. Okay. Multiple biopsies. Do we have any minimum biopsy number of the patient with the software that we can reduce the time consuming procedure? Is that accuracy goes up as you do more biopsies? What's the minimum amount of biopsy that you have to take with lung barrier? So just to repeat the question, the test, the, the question is about the number of biopsies that are needed to perform the tissue cipher test and that there's patients with different numbers of biopsies potentially. You know, we saw it here today where one patient had one sample or maybe three to four jars and your patient had maybe nine jars of you know, tissue. And so I, I think that speaks to the, going back to the validation of the test is that uh, the, the validation studies describe the approaches that are used for validating the assay and you, you require the diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus in non-dysplastic, indefinite for, or low-grade dysplasia. So high-grade dysplasia is one of the predicted any ones that can, the patient cannot have high-grade dysplasia, it actually predicts that. And it requires one sample um, at minimum to evaluate the tissue cipher test. There are uh, other approaches that if you have long sacred bearings that are part of our standard operating procedures as a laboratory, where up to three specimens can be tested. We prioritize the DV junction, the one that's uh, furthest down or closest to the DV junction. But we also look at at different levels that can be selected by the submitting and ordering GI doctor to make sure that the area that you're most concerned about is logically or clinically is the one that's the set for tissues. And, and if, I may, if I may add to that, if I may add to that, I don't think any of these tests replace a good endoscopy. So doing tissue cipher does not mean 
that we have a 10 centimeter barrettes and we can take four bites and tissue cipher will tell us what to do. I think we still do our diligent Seattle protocol biopsy and despite that, we, if we have unanswered question of is this going to progress, then we can have the two samples out of that sent over. So the minimum biopsy, I think if it's just a one centimeter barrettes, we may only take one area. We might only have one cup and that's good enough. But if we have 10 cups, then we usually send the best three, the top of intestinal metaplasia, the GE junction, and somewhere in the middle, which could be the highest grade of dysplasia. The sensitivity specificity is, is validated for the single, the single biopsy, for the high level of sensitivity and specificity. So thank you all for your participation here on the panel. I really enjoyed the discussion and participation from the audience. There are a couple more activities that uh, involve tissue cyber over the course of DDW in the days to follow. Please, uh, Tomorrow we have a topic for us uh, with Dr. Paul Wisniewski uh, and several posters during the poster sessions here on Tuesday, as well as our booth if you'd like to learn more about uh, castro Biosciences and tissue cipher in particular. Um, and we really welcome your uh, participation and feedback as part of these sessions. With that, thank you for your attention and have a great conference. Thank you.